Council Member Alvarez is absent. Council Member Okrepke? Here. Chair Rogers? Here. Let the record reflect that all members are present with the exception of Council Member Alvarez. Great. Do we have any announcements to start with today? Um, the answer is no, that's cool. That's, did you want me to make that announcement? Uh, no, it's all, it's all good. I can make that announcement. Okay. Um, I have tended my resignation with the city of Santa Rosa. So today will be my last economic development subcommittee meeting. And it has been an absolute, oh my God, I'm going to get choked up, honor and pleasure, pleasure to work with you guys for 18 years. 18 years. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, now I'm pulling it together. Well, I, I wasn't trying to force it out of you. I just wasn't sure if we get to give you accolades and say thank you. And you can always matter, what, what the appropriate time to do that is. But. Always. Um, but it does matter for the um, for the for the agenda today. So yeah, uh, that's the first time I said it out loud in a public meeting. So I together now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see if there's any public comments on announcements. Yeah, please. I'm sorry, I did want to take notice of that. 18 years. Oh my gosh. And I want to know personally that you have, you know, your best interests at heart as you go forward. Do you know where you're landing yet, or? I do. Okay. Is it still in government? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Well, good luck to you. Good help. Thank you so much. All right. With that will go on to approval of the minutes. Do you have any amendments to the minutes? All right. Let's see if there's any public comments on the minutes. All right. With that, we'll show them adopted as presented unless there's objection. I see no objection. Let's go on to public comments for non-agenda items. You're not here for this? Uh, not for that part. Thank cool. You. All right. We'll check in. Uh, we'll keep moving then. I don't see anybody else to give comments. Let's go to our new business, item 5.1, that's the introduction of the economic and fiscal impacts of downtown housing study. Yeah, so um, this has been sort of a long time coming, um, and it happened in fits and starts. Um, but um, we had an interest years ago um, stemming from the Urban 3 study that still gets referenced in terms of what is the, um, you know, the economic fiscal impacts of infill housing, downtown housing, and the efforts that we started putting in uh, to place through the um, housing action plan back in 2016, um, working through uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, going through recovery of the fires and this sort of dual track that we've been um, running on in terms of um, uh, our housing efforts um, in the city. Um, and it's come up a lot in the past about, uh, you know, the idea of the Urban 3 study, um, which again, um, really focused on the value of infill development and um, sort of uh, uh, where infrastructure exists, um, that, it's, uh, that housing is of value in those areas. So we wanted to do something, and we hired EPS to do this for us, to give actual numbers to that idea that was um, presented um, back in 2016, 2017. Um, the, I'm going to let them go through the um, presentation. I just want it noted that this is a draft document. It's only being daylighted recently, not just with this committee, um, but also with the people who participated, the developers who participated in giving information um, and what their assumptions are. So now is the time to ask questions, um, to sort of um, give some direction. I do want to set it apart from the EIFD process. We're doing a separate um, infrastructure finance plan. It's a different document than that. This is really serving a, 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 a different purpose, um, but uh, it could perhaps, um, I don't know, we can um, figure out on Thursday if there's any link or, or um, value to that long-term um, tax in increment financing document. This is really um, not that. Um, they did use industry standard uh, assumptions and um, to pick it apart. And I'm going to give it over to uh, Jenny and Ben. 
Excellent. Thank you, Risa. Good morning, uh, honorable committee members. Thank you for having us. I'm Ben Sigman uh, with Economic and Planning Systems, uh, principal in our Bay Area office. I'm joined by Jenny Lin, uh, vice president with the firm, also here in the, the Bay Area. We're uh, really happy to have been uh, part of this work and excited to share it with you this morning. Um, I'll tell you what, uh, just because of the format on, on Zoom here, I'll run through the, the deck. Um, <clears throat> it's probably 15 minutes or so. And then we'll maybe we'll take questions at the end if that's all right. I usually prefer conversational, but I think just given this format, I'll, let me get through it and then we'll back up to any slides we want to really dive into if that's all right. Um, yeah, that works for me. Thanks all. <coughs> okay, Jenny, let's go to the first slide. So, all right. Um, Most importantly, can everybody see the slides? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then I do just to reiterate what Reyes already said. Um, you know, we we gave this uh, you know hard look, coordinated with developers, coordinated with the business community. We studied your budget. Uh, we didn't have extensive conversations with the finance department or city managers department or any department heads on this. So um, you know, we are starting to get some feedback, and so very tough to claw back numbers once you put them out there. But I, I just ask for your sort of cooperation. We're you know very much in a draft format at the, at the moment, so let's not wet ourselves to some of the the uh, the finer points just yet but um we took a uh an you know, a look at both fiscal and economic impacts. Fiscal is a sort of term of art in our world that relates to impacts on the, the general fund or the city's financial condition. Um, the economic impacts um, are more the, the jobs and spending in the local economy, sort of not necessarily money going to the city. Um, on the economic impact side, we did both what I consider a traditional look at, at what we can really expect to be a direct spending on um, both building maintenance and administration, as well as resident spending in the local economy. But then we also took a, a look at uh, more catalytic effects that housing uh, could have in terms of building the economy in, in Santa Rosa. And we worked with uh, through an interview process and then an analytic uh, sort of illustrative process to, to show you how um, reducing the uh, the bottleneck around housing could could really help you grow your economy. And that, that's a little bit of a what we consider sort of catalytic perspective on housing as a, a jump starter to uh, to job creation. OK, let's keep going um, to to begin. We we go one more slide. Um, we looked at everything. We'll, we'll present it to you, you on a per unit basis. And then we sort of gross it up to what we think might be a build out or a, a, a you know, sort of a build out potential in the near term for the, the downtown. Um, so here, starting with the fiscal impact. And again, this is looking at what what new housing could mean for the city's uh, general fund. Uh, we look at both general fund revenue sources, tax sources, so that's property tax, sales tax, and other revenues the city takes in related to housing. And then on the expense side, uh, municipal service uh, provision, so police, fire, and all the other departments serving your, your citizenry. Um, we looked at it across both market rate, that's the top table, and below market rate units, as well as by unit type, studio one, two, and three. And each of those factors influence the, the impact of housing on the city's general fund. Um, here you can see um, just on the top table, general fund revenue increasing from about $1,000 a unit for a studio to one point or 1700 almost for a two bed. And then you can see as the units get bigger, you've got more a population in a in a unit and so the cost of providing municipal service also increases but across the board on the market rate units we think that they would deliver a net fiscal benefit uh, to the city's general fund that's uh, discretionary funding that the city could put uh, in a variety of places um, we're not taking as notable here we're not taking out uh, revenue that that might uh, in reality go to an infrastructure uh, financing district uh, that you're contemplating. So this is this is sort of a stabilized post EIFD uh, kind of perspective or no EIFD perspective. That's all all revenue going to the general fund in our analysis. Um, the lower table is the below market rate units. Um, the smaller one because of the studio because it uh, has this sort of low population number does achieve a, a fiscal benefit for the city. But we would anticipate on the one bed and two bed units that there is a, a modest fiscal cost associated with um, providing municipal service to those units after the, the tax revenue. And tax revenue is down on those because of the uh, lower assessed valuations. Um, and we are assuming uh, that they do get 
on the tax roll, but at a level that's um, sort of commensurate with their rents. Um, and it's it's notable here. So we're treating them as a cl inclusionary housing uh, rather than a standalone uh, affordable housing unit. That actually could be entirely off the tax rolls. And we didn't analyze that. So here, this is sort of a look at, uh, it, it, you know, an inclusionary unit that, that does have a little bit of tax benefit. Okay, we'll keep going. All right, now we're looking at uh, switching gears, switching lenses over to economic impacts. So with every uh, unit, we expect a what we call one-time uh, benefit that comes from construction. Uh, we, we call it one time because, you know, you build the unit, enjoy the jobs and spending in the economy, construction completes and those jobs, uh, you know, go elsewhere, transfer to the next next job, uh, next uh, construction project. Um, we think it's about $450,000 a unit in direct construction spending. That's the upper right hand corner of the top table. Um, that's sort of the money the, the development community is putting into building the units. Uh, for every $450,000 uh, that they spend on a, a housing unit, we think it's almost three jobs, three construction industry jobs. And then we do uh, expect in Santa Rosa, specific to Santa Rosa City, um, some induced uh, in indirect, that's the multiplier or ripple effect as uh, construction companies spend locally on supplies. Um, and also the the uh, the households, the jobs um, themselves sort of with their consumer household consumer spending create some ripple effects in the in the city so that $450,000 that a developer spends to build a unit turns into about $700,000 in economic activity in the city. Um, the three construction jobs after you you sort of factor in that multiplier effect get up to almost four jobs uh, in the city per per unit uh, sort of on a um, we, we might think of it on an annual basis um, and then the bottom table thinking about operating um, the uh, the the units once they're they're built occupied stabilized it's about five thousand dollars a year to uh, to maintain a multifamily unit in Santa Rosa, that's through some of the conversations we had with your development community. And you get that same ripple effect there, uh, where there's some additional spending in the economy because of those management activities. So it's about approaching $7,000 a unit, um, about one job per, per 50 units that get built there overall. Okay, we can keep going. Um, now we, we're pivoting the, the other uh, sort of ongoing uh, impact of of economic impact of having additional housing in your downtown is the spending on uh, retail uh, entertainment and and services. Uh, we use uh, survey data from the bureau, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, on consumer expenditure patterns to identify how uh, households at the you know at, at income levels we think are commensurate with this type of housing, um, how they would spend in the uh, in the economy. And so at the top table, thinking about a market rate unit, and it, it depends, again, the, the smaller studio is likely to be, you know, one, one person. So it's going to be less household spending than the, the larger units, which are going to have more than one person. But it's something between, um, you know, three and a half uh, and six thousand dollars a year in spending on uh, goods and services in the local economy. Once the, again, you get that sort of ripple effect um, through the through the city, uh, it's, you know, could be upwards of seven thousand dollars a year. Uh, any single market rate unit, or I guess that's the larger at the larger end of the spectrum, um, seven thousand dollars a year they might create in economic activity in the city, um, and then as you would expect on the lower table there below market rate units, not quite as much uh, uh, spending attributable to the uh, restricted. Um, income level or, or their income level. And so it's more in the range of three to $4,000 a year in spending on uh, goods and services, which uh, has a ripple effect, um, gets you a, a bit above that. Um, overall though, we're looking at, you know, in the range of one, one job in Santa Rosa between roughly 30 and, and 50 uh, units, depending on the unit type. So modest effect, but it, it, it adds up. So, that's good, Jenny. Thank you. So now we th those you laid out kind of the range of values we see um, on a per unit basis, and I, I realized that was probably like drinking from a fire hose. So we'll we'll definitely go back uh, and look at that more if you wish. Um, but we started here to consider what that um, those per unit fiscal and economic impacts um, mean if you start to think about them uh, across uh, build out of your your downtown. We we recognize the downtown plan. Uh, provides capacity for 7,000 units, 
that's sort of a, you know, maybe a hypothetical or, or ceiling to the, to the build out. So we considered here about half that 3,500 uh, unit build out. Um, we talked to the uh, a number of the developers actively pursuing projects in town. They, and they have different perspectives on how they're going to serve um, the market. But we 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 created a blend here of studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms that we think captures sort of the range of perspectives out there. Some some of the developers are more interested in studios, thinking they're really underprovided at the moment. Some you know some don't really share that. But 40, 40, 20 studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms is the mix we ran in our scenario. Um, and then we include the 8% uh, for inclusionary housing um, policy perspective in this. And you can see the uh, that's the darker blue in the in the chart there. So all in you know, 280 uh, affordable units and 3,220 market rate units. And, and this is just a, you know, you could obviously ask us to do different scenarios with the modeling we've we've done, but you know, this is what we, we went in with in terms of a mix of unit types and build out and uh, market rate and below market rate. And we're gonna show you what, if this were the program that were to be built in downtown uh, Santa Rosa, what it means in terms of fiscal and economic impact totals. So that's where we're going. Next slide. Okay, we'll start with the fiscal. Uh, so with that program, um, tax revenue to the general fund from the 3,500 units comes out to about four and a half million dollars um, annually in in today's today's money. So we're not escalating it for you know money ten years from now when this might be built out. So four and a half million total revenue. We think it would cost the city about three point seven million dollars in municipal service costs to. Uh, to um, satisfy the demands from those those units, so it's a net fiscal benefit to the general fund of almost nine hundred thousand dollars a year today's money when this uh, this program's built out. On the um, revenue side, property tax is the biggest contributor. It's about half the revenue. On the um, on the cost side, it no surprise public safety, police, and fire make up almost seventy percent of the cost of provide municipal service to the to the units. So, um, you know, again, our 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 first look at this um, and and without the benefit of meeting with police and fire or reviewing this in, in you know, great detail with the city. But we use cost um, uh, sort of allocation factors. They're very typical of a city of, of your size. And, um, you know, there is uh, a bit of um, professional judgment in there, but we think it's it's very much consistent with what we've observed throughout uh, Northern California. OK. Keep going. On the economic impact side, uh, well, let's start with the construction jobs. Um, it, it is almost it, it built out to you know 3,500 units, 1.6 almost billion dollars in construction activity uh, when it ripples through the local economy. And you guys have this great sort of um, you know economy there where you you know bit of an island, and so you do have these really good multiplier effects as a result of that. So. Um, almost a almost a billion dollars, nine hundred million dollars in ripple effect as all your uh, suppliers sort of jump into action to serve the construction projects. So all in, it could be two and a half uh, billion dollars in economic activity that comes from the construction of thirty five hundred units. Um, it's almost fifteen thousand. We call them job years, and that's that's a little bit confusing, which is why we provide the the table below, which is we we take that one time construction impact and we spread it out over a decade. And even that might be a little bit aggressive. And you can see really all we're doing is taking the, the top table and dividing it all by 10, but it really helps uh, digest the jobs number. So what that means is we'd have about 1500 construction related jobs uh, in service during the uh, the construction decade. And it'd be about a, uh, a quarter of a billion dollars a year in economic activity um, over that over that time period. Okay, we can come back to that again if we need to, but pretty significant. Um, the, the downside is just that it, you know, it's it's fleeting. It only occurs when the construction's happening, then it's gone. All right, Jenny, let's go to operational impacts. Okay, so then the resident spending all in really does add up almost $17 million a year in direct spending on goods and services in the local economy. When that ripples through, um, it, it you get another two and a half million. So it's almost $20 million a year in spending in the economy that comes from uh, that those households out uh, opening up their wallets and pocketbooks. Uh, it's almost 150 jobs that might be added just from that. Uh, the property management piece also pretty significant when you gross it up $17 million a year to run the apartments, a little bit of a ripple effect, you get up to 25 million, 24 million total. And so 70 jobs 
total in Santa Rosa that could be related to um, operations and maintenance of uh, 3,500 new multifamily uh, rental units in the in the downtown. Um, so all in the, that operational perspective, we not not adding it up here, but it's a, you know over 40 million total, just ongoing operational benefit, including the the residents spending and the the running of the uh, the, the apartments themselves. Um, okay, we can keep going. All right, so those were the sort of, you know, if, if any developer or city said, "What's the economic impact of a housing project? Fiscal economic impact?" Those are the types of numbers we would we would show, and very well accepted, kind of methodologically in in our world. And now we get into this sort of what was the interesting and and more challenging perspective for this work that we did, and it's thinking about how, uh, you know, Santa Rosa might actually become a more competitive location for economic development um, if the housing downtown uh, were, were to be sort of built, um, you know, in, in a critical mass. Um, you know, as, as economists, we tend to come at this and say, you know, housing, with the exception of what we, we just went over, housing generally doesn't create jobs, right? Uh, companies create jobs, business creates jobs. Um, but but what we, we did to sort of really think it through in, in this case is to reach out to the business community and ask them, it, what's preventing you from growing more rapidly, and or you know what 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 keeps you up at night in terms of sustaining your business in Santa Rosa, and um, across these interviews, housing was far and away the number one concern. And granted, we're focused on housing, but um, you know, so so what we heard, we're, we've sort of summarized the the key findings of our our set of interviews uh, here in this slide. And that, you know, basically we're hearing from both, and we did sort of a mix of small local businesses, as well as some of the larger international businesses you have that are, uh, you know, have, a you know, a sites in Santa Rosa. Um, and we heard that th these businesses are struggling with recruiting, they're struggling with retaining, and they attribute that to housing, the, the sort of number two might be uh, child care. Um, they, there's a, a insufficient mix of housing uh, that you, you don't find. Uh, enough of the um, sort of smaller rental multifamily condo type housing in the city. And so when they're, you know, especially recruiting um, younger talent out of uh, out of schools, it's, it's just a very challenging sort of um, mix of housing that might be available to them. They strongly believed, uh, you know, 75 percent of the interviewees believed that the, the, they would be growing uh, their job base in Santa Rosa if the housing uh, were more more available, if so supply constraints were relieved. Um, and, and I'll come back to that in a sec. And then also that um, the what housing would do for the downtown in terms of creating more of a 18-hour um, district or, a, you know, a, a vibrant downtown core really would appeal to many of the types of employees they're trying to recruit and, and that that aspect of it would benefit uh, the city from an economic standpoint. I want to come back to the third bullet point because that that's the one where what we essentially find through this interview process is that the the housing is a binding constraint on economic growth, right? And that's what got us comfortable with the idea. If we fix the housing supply issue, it it enables businesses to to increase their their workforce grow their grow their economic activity in the city, and so that's that's what we're we're essentially saying here. And we're going to illustrate what that could mean in terms of jobs and and dollars in in Santa Rosa. But it was this interview process that got us to the the conclusion that you do have a binding constraint around housing, and if we can fix that, we think you know we heard from multiple employers they would have there would be more jobs associated with their companies in Santa Rosa if the houses were there to support it. So, okay, so let's go to the next. So then the question becomes, if you if you were to build 3,000 to 4,000, here we're doing a, a range kind of around that 3,500 unit build out, how many new jobs would we expect? And we toyed with some different ideas. You know, should we uh, come up with sort of a hypothetical campus expansion? Should, you know, how do we sort of figure out what the economic development would be? And I think we came up with a, a very reasonable and, and also uh, sort of somewhat novel approach. Um, in the figure here, we're looking at the distribution of jobs in Santa Rosa today uh, by industry. So heavy in uh, healthcare, social assistance, retail, construction, technical services, government, 
um, in the down the list use manufacturing. So that that's the makeup of the economy today. And we simply said, if we add housing, we're going to get more of the, the Santa Rosa economy in the mix of industries that we have now. So we didn't say you're you know, we're, we're, you're going to build this housing and you're going to get tech or you're going to build this housing and you're going to get nurses and doctors. We said the economy can, you know, maintains its existing um, distribution of jobs and it sort of grows as it is that way. And uh, what we're concluding, and we'll show you a little bit of the math on the next slide, is that those 3,000 to 4,000 units would, would get you about 2,000 to 2,600 new jobs. And in the mix of jobs distribution you have now, that might mean um, up, upwards of 450 healthcare jobs, could be 200 professional services jobs, another 100 to 150 uh, manufacturing jobs. So you get, you get the idea there. Um, okay, so um, I'll, I'll get back to the math in a sec then. So this is what that, that would mean we, in terms of, we again, factoring in the, uh, the ripple effects. 2,000 to 2,600 jobs come in because of that housing. Could be upwards of uh, half a billion dollars a year in additional economic activity, direct uh, you know, performance of those businesses in Santa Rosa. And then again, that ripple or multiplier effect adding 50 to $70 million dollars. Um, so we're, we're, you know, even with that ripple effect, well, in the in the range of, of half a billion dollars a year in additional economic activity in the city. So r really pretty, pretty meaningful, assuming you get the same mix of uh, industry jobs that you, you have now. Um, and then I don't, uh, let me just like walk you through a little bit, maybe we go back one slide, Jenny, on this one. So so the way we think about this, you know, you may, I don't know if it's sort of surprising or not that, you know, you, you had 3,000 to 4,000 housing units, and you don't get 3,000 to 4,000 jobs. The idea is that we're going to have about 5,000 uh, new residents, and, and about half of them, we assume, will be workers. And that's based on the makeup of the city today in terms of you have a, you know, you have sort of uh, stay at home folks, you, you know, you have retirees. And we didn't want to, again, sort of uh, presume that you you build this housing and all you get is young tech workers. We do see this as potentially a downsizing housing for uh, retirees. There are a lot of different folks who who would want these houses. So so we uh, essentially say you know just just as we did with the industry makeup, these residents will look like the residents of Santa Rosa today. Half of them will be uh, working, and then <clears throat> so that you you know down, you're down at about twenty five hundred, and then. We looked at your commute patterns and we said, and this was a, a sort of an impressive factor when we considered it relative to other cities we work in, but a, more than a third of working residents living in Santa Rosa uh, have their jobs locally in the city. Um, and that, so that's a really strong kind of capture of, of local employees um, relative to, to most places. And I, again, I think it's because you have this sort of island economy there in uh, Sonoma County. Um, and so we assume that same commute pattern, a a, over a third, 36% uh, of, of these new employees that would take uh, residents in the downtown housing work locally. And then if you look at uh, any, you know, on average employers in Santa Rosa, uh, the employees 60% <clears throat> are commuting in. So we assume that same in commute pattern applies. So you, by bringing, you know, releasing the a binding constraint of housing supply, you get local employees, and then you get this also this sort of agglomeration effect that happens as, the, as that local job base can be grown, you do get more in commuting to, uh, to fill out the uh, local employment uh, potential. Um, and so that, yeah, all in, uh, right, it, it, we work it out to about 2,000 to 2,600 new jobs. And I think it's really, let's just flip to that last slide again, just really, you know, you have some um, extremely valuable industries in town. And if they're, if you sort of uncork their potential, it, it really does. Um, I think, it, you know, this slide here revealed the, um, the pretty significant economic benefit you all could enjoy um, if that housing constraint were lifted. So I'll stop there. Thank you for letting me uh, go on for as long as I did. I'm happy to take uh, questions. We'll, we'll, you know, filter back to whatever slide you all want to see, but um, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you for your, your work on this. I'm going to start with my colleague to see if he's got questions. Uh, no. You got no questions? I'm still taking this all in. 
Yeah, I, I think it, it is. It's a lot. And I think it's it dense. actually put, it is. Uh, but I'm just going to uh, editorialize a little bit. I think it puts some numbers and some uh, not quite science, but some data behind what the theory has been on a lot of the conversations that we've had around the jobs and housing linkage in our community. And I know that this was hinted at uh, when we did the Urban 3 study and looked at the economic impact, but this is much more localized and much more specific. I did have uh, two specific conversa uh, questions for you. One, one of the things that I've been a really strong advocate for, uh, for the city to do is to update our local preference. Uh, and our local preference currently, uh, I believe it's five per, uh, I believe it's uh, 1% where a local bidder on contracts can be up to 1% higher than somebody who's out of the area. <laughs> and I've always thought that because of the multiplier effect and because of keeping that money locally, that that 1% seemed like kind of an arbitrary barrier. Whereas if we know the, the multiplier effect is gonna be six, 7%, that perhaps being able to go up to 3% or 4% still made economic sense for our city. Um, in your analysis, do you see room for us to re-engage on that conversation? And do you think that it'd be a benefit to us long-term uh, if we could find a nexus point that, that worked? Mm. It, it's interesting. I, I, I do think so. Um, are you specifically speaking about construction or is it any uh, city vendor? It, we do, uh, we'd have to talk about what we wanted it to yeah. apply to, but I, I, believe it's, okay. I, I believe it's yeah. mostly uh, procurement. Uh, okay. So, so with construction, we see, you know, typically the, you, you get the, the bulk of the jobs end up at the construction site. A lot of the um, materials can still be sourced within the city, right? So it is possible. Basically, I'm saying when you hire a construction company and they move the operation, essentially they operate in Santa Rosa for the period, they may still be achieving similar um, indirect uh, and, and induced effects. I, I think, it, you know, if they in particular are local, some of the... Um, what we're called induced, which is the household spending. If they, they're a local company, their employees live locally, their household spending is local, then you probably are getting that, um, you know, a lot of that ripple effect. Whereas if you took a company from, you know, farther away and their, you know, their employees are commuting in, they're going, then they're, they're you know, going home uh, at the end of the day, their household spending isn't really translating into multi multiplier effects. I, I do think, you, you know, getting a local company does probably increase the overall multiplier effect there. I'm just pointing out with construction that the, the economic activity is a little bit more mobile. Um, if, you know, if it's a different kind of, if it's a professional service and you hire so, you know, a company from, uh, you know, whether you know, Oakland, San Jose, whatever it might be, um, yeah, no, I think that that's fair. You're, you're really probably not getting the benefit of the local multiplier effects. And I think that could be a justification for increasing the local percentage differential. Um, and, you know, I, it's just important to know, we, you know, the modeling that we do is based on a, a lot of a lot of county level data that gets sort of interpolated down to local cities based on um, some some of the the economic characteristics locally. Um, I guess what I mean is they are estimates, right? It's very difficult to actually run to ground the degree to which these uh, multiplier effects are are realized. But it's a very well accepted perspective, um, and the the you're absolutely right that you know if you get a local company and they are there particularly if there is meaningful inputs to the supply of the uh, the the production process that they are generating um so local printing you know if it's you're actually buying sort of physical wares like your parks department right they're you know they're out there buying concrete bricks cement whatever it is and if they're buying that locally you're really going to get that effect so um i do think there's there's that argument holds water. I do think that um, particular industries, you know, it might be more valid. And I, I, I think though, you just be the, the word of caution is, you know, trying to be so precise as, you know, 1% to 3%, it, it, it worries me that, you know, the, it, 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 it would be, it would be challenging to, to be, you know, 
technically accurate at that level of detail. No, I but, can appreciate that. And, and yeah. thank you. And then my second question for you, um, you mentioned that particularly in construction, that the analysis showed that it probably increased about 1,470 workforce jobs per year uh, to hit that goal. Did your analysis look at all to see what the demand or availability was for those construction workers? Because as we talk about this, is there a need for us to put more emphasis on the training and the workforce development side if we're going to hit these goals? Or, uh, or would that act as sort of a, a, a tailwind or a drag to it? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Because, you, you know, and we always try to be careful to, to in choosing our words around economic impacts related to construction. And, you know, we tend to go with, you know, with a construction project will support rather than generate jobs. Because usually what we're thinking is that construction industry is in place. And what 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 this downtown housing does is give that in that existing industry something to do for you know a period of time and then they move on to the next job um and in reality right the the construction has been ebbs and flows and you know and, and especially at the moment you know mi minimal construction activity and we've seen over the years right where um recessionary periods really erode the construction industry and it becomes very hard for it to ramp back up as you enter a a boom moment in a in a new development cycle um I, I think this is a situation where, you know, if, an, if, if over time, I mean, we, we've sort of divided everything by 10, right, in terms of, you yeah. know, thinking about it oh, way overly simplistic. In reality, this sort of ramps up and I think the industry kind of um, starts to accommodate that growth. I mean, what we saw uh, in Oakland here when we went through a pretty significant multifamily construction boom in, you know, in the, you know, basically the, the last looking back maybe five, eight years is that there There were a lot of relocations, right? Initially, um, you know, we saw parking lots around these projects filled with license plates from Idaho and Oregon and, you know, all over. And then I think over time there were, you know, that as it became clear that there was a steady stream of work, um, more of those, more of those construction workers, you know, either came out of uh, trade schools or apprenticeships or, or moved here um, for those jobs. And, and so I think, you know, as the industry kind of kicks into gear around opportunities, I think there may be, um, you know, ways that the city can can support the, you know, support the trades or support um, training programs. But, you, you know, I, I don't think you sort of set yourself up for that initially anticipating a problem. You, you probably let the, you know, let this sort of kick off and get into gear and and if what you're hearing is there are certain kinds of constraints, you you're more strategic in trying to sort of identify where the city can, you know, re really plug in and alleviate um, problems with the construction industry. Industry, um, and we and I think maybe the simplest answer, to, if, if it wasn't clear from from this response, is no, we did not evaluate is there so, you know sort of capacity in the construction industry now to. Um, to accommodate this exact kind of level of activity, but it was notable, right? The construction is the, was it the third most significant employer in the city? So it, you know, it's there and it's, and it's meaningful. And then last question. Um, and it's just a, what I heard and I want to make sure I'm, I'm accurate on it is that your analysis used a loose um, inflation or escalator over the course of the, the 10 year period. Uh, and I mean, obviously, that's, you know, throwing a dart at a dartboard based on what historically has happened. So I, I get that. But I just wanted to make sure that that was built into the model as well. So, so all the dollars we show you are 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 today today's dollars, 2023 okay. dollars, zero escalation. So it, you certainly could um, uh, take a take a crack at what you think escalation is and start to blow these up to to future dollars, but I think for a couple of reasons we we tend to not do that in our work. And and one, you know, it's hard for people to understand if I tell you, you know, it's it's three it's three billion dollars. You're thinking that's three billion dollars, but in reality, it's two and a half, right? Because that, yeah. that's that's what it means today. So people don't really understand future dollars. That's problem number one. 
Um, and problem number two is, is we'd just be guessing, right, what, what the escalation rates will be. So we, we avoid both those problems by showing you all of the dollars uh, in, you know, in today's money. It's, it's more understandable and it and avoids making another assumption. And then the other thing is that all of the economic relationships, we're constantly showing you, here's the, the dollars activity in the economy and here's what it means in terms of jobs. Those relationships are also a snapshot of today, which, which keeps us on sort of solid footing. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. And I, I know I'll have a lot more questions. I know my colleague will once we get a chance to digest it a little bit further and talk about how it fits with our economic development strategy plan and the EIFD work and, and all of that. Uh, just want to thank you for that. Um, let's, go to, let's go to public comment on the item. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Is it okay if I stand here? Yeah, yeah please do. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks. I appreciate right. that. Yes. Can you give me a minute to pull up the public comment slide? Uh, Jenny, can you stop sharing your screen? Just give uh, me up. I, I also can just do it off of the clock if that works for folks. <laughs> Uh, I got it. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I'm, I'm much more low tech <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and, um, I've trained myself to be a three minute guy. So <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to make some comments. I do find the study a little bit flawed and distorted in some of its assumptions. First of all, uh, what I know about EPS is not necessarily flattering. Uh, studies I came by uh, that they performed before really have not been vetted well. Uh, this particular study, and of course you know me for vacation rental, but the impact of vacation rental on affordable and workforce housing in Sonoma County was really a um, textbook case of propaganda when we went to research this and pull this apart. So here I find some of the same trends sort of repeating itself. Clearly this is a study that was paid for by these professional landlords that are coming on the scene to build about 3,500 apartments. These are not properties that people will be able to invest in and build family wealth. I think that's a huge difference when it comes to economic analysis, as well as the retention factor for our key employees and businesses. Furthermore, I see that this rental stock will be of service to the lower income households. Surely we'll have people moving into these units that don't have a car, for instance, uh, and that are seniors that are on low incomes, and that really needs to be taken into consideration when you're doing an economic analysis. Furthermore here, and I think there should actually be a law that prevents this, I don't really see the initial scoping document or um, you know, when the project was assigned or any of those key points that go into fiscal management for government. Those are missing from this and I'm not sure why. I know that you guys have gone out of the way to say that this wasn't something that was ordained by city management or was it is independent of the special taxation dinner, uh, but that's not really passing the sniff test, quite frankly. Uh, we do recognize that there's about a billion and a half dollars that are being invested by these professional landlords to build this housing stock. And this is a study that is essentially just pulling what their interests are and serving it back up for public consumption. So I think that's sort of, um, you know, something to be really concerned about. Um, and I could quibble about so many other uh, questions here, but I understand this is just sort of a first step in the process. But I will say that things are sort of veering off course in a big way, in sort of a big bubblish, hyperactive way of rah rahism with this type of data. And this is something that government needs to move away from because it doesn't create good policy. And the policy that creates cements into government protracted conflict and drama over policy that wasn't really set in a factual basis. So I would suggest that you sort of give pause to this process, really understand what you're doing and dive deep on some of these assumptions and speculations. Thank you so much, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, Eric. Are there any other public comments? <coughs> All right, I'll, I'll bring it back um, and I'll, I'll let uh, staff and folks uh, answer. I think there's some good questions in there. Uh, but my assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, was that the 3,500 number was to coincide with our regional housing needs assessment and that the makeup of those units was largely driven by what the state is telling us we need to build also. Demand and the arena. Right. I mean, I think Ben touched on that a little bit. I mean, we have um, certain... Um, 
uh, numbers in the general plan, right? Uh, in the downtown station area specific plan. Um, and then, yeah, that it takes into consideration arena numbers. But they took that, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, you, uh, the 7,000 from the downtown station area specific plan and brought it down to 50%, yeah. which seems reasonable based on arena numbers. Okay. Exactly. And I, do want, I want to underscore um, the preface that Ryan's have provided at the top of this presentation that this is an administrative draft, uh, a draft that we have not discussed internally. Um, I know that my CFO is going to put me in a headlock when we leave here, right? Um, and so, yes, there are I, questions. I'd actually candidly like to see that. <laughs> there, there, there are some questions. I think there is some really good qualitative data that has been presented, um, very insightful, the, the interviews that were conducted. Um, I, I do think that whenever you're talking about any theoretical framework, it's important at the top to understand what the assumptions are. Um, and I, I understand that certain projections um, are included in this presentation. Um, and again, we haven't had the opportunity to speak internally or with the consultant um, on those projections. I, I will tell you that at first glance, um, I, I, I'm not sure that the general fund uh, expenses, um, if we've captured service delivery accurately in those projections. Again, I don't know. Um, and so I want to provide that context. Um, and yes, we will uh, work through this report. Uh, we will get with the consultant on the questions that we have. Um, and we will absolutely come back to you, uh, if need be, with, with updated projections. Right. And I'll, I'll add to, as far as the unit count goes, um, really what we're looking at with the 7,000 is more of the maximum densities that are allowed. Um, what we've really been trying to strategize for is what is a reasonable number to scope around. And much of that is based on the market demands, what they can move forward with. So as they engage the development side, it's a better understanding of that product that the development team is moving forward. But overall, it is working within the constraints of the downtown station area plan. Um, when we look at the distribution of affordable units, it's all really based on that. But even numbers do come into that equation. Um, and similar to what Darielle mentioned, I think an important point here is we have really two interesting processes going at the same time that will affect these numbers. Um, and I think Chair Rogers, you, you mentioned it with uh, EIFD moving forward. As we look at what our revenue projections are coming in, that's really the basis of this study. It's understanding what the revenue is and ultimately what those expenditures are against that revenue. Um, so, and I know it was mentioned in the beginning of this, it's very difficult to call back numbers. I think it's good for the committee to see the methodology, how we tackle this problem. And it really is expanding on the Urban 3 concept, right? The Urban 3 concept was very high level, very general, and it starts really drilling down on the facts. But I think to an important point, we will vet it out. We'll work that through the committee. We'll understand what it looks like. And as the EIFD starts to evolve and we better understand what those revenue projections look like through the EIFD in the downtown area, then that affects this study. Um, so this is really just the beginning conversation for that. And we appreciate the really open and honest feedback and that'll help us move forward in, in the best manner possible um, to start working on this concept, which I think is a really important point for downtown. It's uh, understanding the question comes up often about, is it a net gain or a loss with the development of housing? And this is this is helping to, to lay out that, that um, thought process and that argument. Any additional comments? No, I just think that um, why I do appreciate it is administrative draft. There's a lot of moving parts. There's things that could change. Um, you know, and there are some, some points in here that I think are very valuable and some uh, good takeaways. You know, we've talked before in this subcommittee about um, our island economy and, and how that can be a detriment sometimes to attracting businesses and, and um, uh, talent. But it's also good to hear uh, the, the double-edged sword of that, that there's multipliers that come in with that as well, that once you get things here, it multiplies in, in various ways to make it more beneficial, um, which I think is great. Um, and then I understand they're hypothetical, and that is large, bold, all caps on this. But um, it is good to see that uh, the, the reports of downtown's demise have been greatly exaggerated. Um, and that I think there's real um, opportunity considering what we can have available to us and what we can do. Um, if these are 
remotely accurate. I'm, I'm very pleased to see some of this. You know, just um, Ashley just pointed out to um, the some of the uh, information on the hypothetical build that like units at eight percent um, designated below market. It's actually four percent. So then some of these things are again, I think, going to be reflective. Like it, it couches what this is on the assumptions that we make, um, and not <clears throat> counting, not discussing the fiscal piece of it. I will say um, their findings in the current discussions with developers. Um, on terms of what the needs are and with businesses can, are consistent with what we've been finding since we started on the housing action plan um, and some version of this way back in 2016. It remain, housing followed by childcare remains one of the top issues of growth here. Um, so what kind of growth? And we'll get into that in the, e in the economic development strat plan, um, but there's easy money with retail, right? But then the kind of growth that we're really looking for is affected by housing. And so I think the ongoing discussion of what, what this looks like um, it, it is gonna matter over time, you know, for the growth of our industries. Yeah. Oh, but that, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ben. Thank you, Jenny. Let's jump into the economic development strat plan. Thank that you guys so item. much. All right. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it. We'll be in touch. Okay. All right. Bye -bye. Take care. Yeah. So that, um, it is a very interesting um, conversation about this because, you know, I just want to preface before we get into um, the strat plan is that for a long time, the question I've been asked a lot was why don't, why didn't you update the strat plan earlier? You know, we did do a hard pivot in economic development and worked really specifically in housing and housing, um, specifically uh, density uh, infill housing. Um, and so this is really the first step back out into an actual plan. Um, I'm gonna actually um, send this around um, because I, the way I was thinking of doing the, um, going through the strategic action plan is um, <coughs> focusing on the implementation part because I think it's gonna be easier for us to sort of um, go through it in this way. And so that'll make its way to you. It's just that I just pulled out um, and made larger the back section of the um, of the plan. All right, um, Eric, anybody need one? Oh, please. So, um, in going through this, <clears throat> I have one extra too. If you need. Um, this is, like I said, this is um, the, just the last section. It's the pullout of what was attached onto the agenda. So it's not something new or different. So in going through the economic development plan, I just want to start with what the elements are. Um, so we've been working on this, I have to say, for over a year. Um, really, we started moving it forward really beautifully, I think, um, when we had the public conversations here in this um, subcommittee. Um, the the way it's set right now, I do need to add a background element um, to it. I just put um, a page in there saying that that I need to add that it's um, where we are now, what brought us to this point, the general background information, um, how it addresses council policies and priorities or council goals and priorities, um, and um, really hitting on the fact that one of the things that we need to do is recognize that we need fiscal stability and, and revenue growth. So I will work on some language for that first background section. Um, the second part of it, of course, is the summary. Um, it lists the three, um, the three primary goals. Um, and we had landed on three elements, which we'll get into under the, the next part, which is the, the strategic plan part of it. Um, but one of the questions that I want to ask now and was um, raised actually by the city manager's office is, are these, do we need more goals? <laughs> um, do we capture what we need within this? Um, what is missing or do we need to expand it at all? Um, the second part, of course, is the plan part. So again, it, it's set up to where there's goals, objectives, and tactics, um, which is implement, uh, mirrored in the implementation plan part of it. Um, the monitoring and evaluation and the implementation plan. I've left the, the evaluation metrics target blank um, because for one thing, it's a living, breathing document. Not all things are gonna be priorities. Um, not all things are going to be done, you know, 
from the get go, you know, once this is adopted. And so we need to be able to have space to look at the things based on the market and the situation and whatever the environment is now when we're starting on some of these uh, tactics and objectives or objectives and tactics. Um, so my hope was, and we can certainly change this because staff can certainly build it out, is to be able to address these things and work with you on what are the metrics and targets you want. Um, do what, you know, sometimes we have ideas on what the evaluation tool will be, but that evaluation tool either takes money or it's something that's a resource that we don't have access to yet. Um, so that's why I sort of left it blank, but we can, we can review that. Um, so again, the um, next part of it was the um, implementation plan, and we'll get into that. Then I put the San Rosa landscape, just so we have an understanding of sort of who we are um, right at this moment. Um, I will say that the landscape piece of it, um, we do updates on a quarterly basis so we can modify what the, the economic development quarterly reports look like um, and add additional information. I think it's helpful that we period periodically review that here um, and then have that maybe uh, help us focus in on, um, on the implementation. And then finally, I have resources and links in it. So if there's not any questions on what the format looks like or comments, like if you'd like to see anything just in the format, we can actually start digging into the goals, objectives, and tactics. Mm -hmm. okay. I can actually add one thing, right? Yeah. Um, so as, as we move forward, um, just give clarity on process. Obviously, Rice is transitioning your career moving forward. Um, the team will pick this up. Um, I just want to make She's sure. not doing both. She's not <laughs> planning on doing both. So I just really want to make it clear on deliverables and next steps um, so the committee is aware. Um, typically, it, it's helpful to engage on implementation strategies because it helps to better understand the goal and what the thought process of the goal is. Um, but I'd like to make it incredibly clear is implementation strategies are usually not included in the adopted plan. And there's a few different reasons for that. At the staff level, we need the flexibility to be able to generally understand the goal, generally understand the parameters around implementation, but we need to be able to have that flexibility to shift that on the back end when it actually comes down to that. Um, so I want to make it just incredibly clear to the members of um, the committee as well as the public is the implementation strategies likely will not be part of the adopted document. We can discuss those as we move forward, um, but typically, and, and happy to answer any questions about that, but typically that plan would live outside of the overall adopted strat plan. It would be a companion to that, um, and it would be something that we would implement and we'd start showing council work plan items, and there, there would be other ways we would move that forward. Um, but I, I just want to make it incredibly clear is that although we're presenting that today, that it won't be part of that final plan, most likely. Yeah, um, just so to reiterate and make sure, so the plan will come forward, the document will come forward, uh, we'll continue with engagement on it up until, and quite frankly, probably after adoption from the council, uh, and then the implementation plan will be with it as a discussion point, not part of the approval, but then the public and the council will get periodic updates and further discussion on the implementation plan as it's actually working through its process. Correct, and it's similar to the Violence Prevention Partnership Strategic Plan. So you all received the actual strategic plan. Um, there was conversation, but uh, I believe every quarter we come back to you all with implementation on the plan that was adopted. So yeah. This is very similar to that. I think that's helpful because I think some of the concern that folks sometimes have is the plan's going to be internal and they're never going to get, they're never going to know what's happening, what's not happening. They're never going to get another chance to ask questions. So I think making that really clear right off the bat is really helpful. Yeah, and um, just um, the previous plans that we've had, we've done that. It's Again, it's usually through the Economic Development um, Subcommittee. Um, to be fair, one of the uh, models that I looked at was Oakland. They have it included so you can look at priorities, but it should always be a living document. So decoupling, it makes um, sense in this case. Um, and then it's just a tracking, uh, tracking mechanism. Cool. Um, okay. So um, just working off of the um, spreadsheet then, 
Um, so again, the three goals that we have are um, business climate and communication. So I mean, really that is um, what is it like to do business with the city? How business friendly are, are we? Um, so if we're gonna be doing um, business attraction, retention, expansion, are we, is our house in order on the inside for us to be able to accommodate those efforts? Um, the second goal is economic vibrancy, which really is um, the business attraction, retention, expansion. And then the third part of it is resiliency and community investment. That's really the upstream um, efforts. Um, we um, are, you know, stepping a little bit back from the housing elements, but it's got, you know, those uh, things like the guaranteed basic income things that we're currently doing. Because again, we've been working on this for a long time. We do have some of our ongoing projects in here. Um, uh, it's also the childcare effort. That's an ongoing thing. Um, housing, anything that fits within that sort of um, community investment piece of it is in that third resilient, the third bucket. Um, so is um, the city manager on actually? She wasn't, let me check again. Okay, because if she is, if you could just promote her. Because uh, there was an interest um, in passing and saying that you know, she was interested in some additional um, goals. I don't know yet what those goals are, but again, I put on the table, are these the right three um, goal areas? I'm um, digging into the first one, um, objective one, which is the um, business friendly policies and processes. Um, it's the three pieces of it. We are in the process right now, and I, uh, Gabe's <laughs> running it, um, of the development. Of, oh, I should say, as I say this, not everything lands on economic development. Economic development has been really like two people. Um, it is impossible to do. I, economic development lives in every department everywhere. Um, so though it may be in some of these things, um, and we may have a, a statement in it, we are not economic development, the staff people, whoever's gonna be coming in after me are not the sole proprietors of any element of this, of this plan. So um, on the first objective, the um, development and in implementation of um, a strategic, I mean, a service, development services strategic plan, um, that's actually underway. And that is um, under the purview of uh, Gabe right now in the in PED. Um, the other element of it, is coming up with an ad hoc group that's flexible, um, that's able to be uh, take advantage of and influence some of the, the um, issues that we're seeing. Um, and it's not just an internal group, but it's actually um, you know working with the chambers of commerce or um, you know we've been involved with the Bay Area Urban Manufacturing um, Initiative, um, anything that can sort of like as we identify an issue or an opportunity um, can weigh into uh, policies or um, objectives that we have that are sort of citywide. And the last piece of that objective is um, the uh, you know one stop shop, sort of making it easy at, uh, and identifying new things to help people get the information that they need. Um, at any given time, like sometimes we have an influx of people needing signage information. We look at the signs, we're actually looking at the sign policy. Um, so it can lead all of those things into that first objective. Um, I can keep going. And if you, or, or do you guys want me to go through it piece by piece? Or do you want to sort of, do you have highlights where you'd like to actually focus on stuff? Whoops. How do you want to do it? Because we've both, we've seen this, We've talked about it. This is yeah. uh, multiple meetings. How about um, let's do public comment okay. on it. Okay. See if there's questions mm -hmm. from the public that can kind of guide <clears throat> what we have not made particularly clear in some of the meetings. Yeah. See if it shakes a couple of things loose and then come back for comments. And okay, good. Because yeah, it's a lot to go over individually. Like it, 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 is. So. <laughs> it is. It is. It, it, that's a good thing. Yeah. So let's let's start with public comment. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate the work on this. Uh, Eric Frazier, <laughs> Santa Rosa. Um, so what strikes me about this is that these issues are not necessarily new issues. And what's not coming forward are prior, prior metrics of performance that judges how well the chapel has done already. So that's really quite concerning. I find this sort of all sort of a mishmash of not really good, clear planning, quite frankly. Because of that, there is no continuity 
from a management sense or a way to have accountability over prior activity and expenses at the city. So that is actually very concerning. I'm going to put an overlay on this about the short-term rental ordinance because I think that's important and represents a major policy initiative that was very expensive, very divisive, isn't solved yet. And at the end of the day, what we ended up with, if you marry the three ordinances that have to do with short-term occupancy, two taxing ordinances and then the short-term rental ordinance itself, what you guys did is you made it a misdemeanor offense for somebody to have a guest in their own home while they're there <laughs> that on a short-term basis if that property is not registered. It's really quite embarrassing how bad the policy became because you put the community through a series of urgency ordinances that totally negate the sensibilities that you're putting forward in this plan, you did not provide a mechanism for fact finding and verification when you were making policy. Furthermore, the policy seemed to be driven by entrenched self-interest. So that's very, very concerning. So you can put a lot of ink on paper about what your strategic planning is about but at the end of the day, how are you actually serving your community? Are you standing up and being accountable to the voters when it comes to how money is spent and what happens when that money is spent? I don't see it in this plan. And that's fundamental to business. So when you have a business, you're paying attention to how your employees spend their money. You want them to be accountable for that spend. None of that's here. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Eric. So I'm going to bring it back. Um, so the first question that I think we should dive into is you asked, do we need an additional goal? Um, and I, your thoughts? Um, I don't think we do personally. Um, I, I understand economic development. I mean, economic development, and you and I have had this discussion, I've had a discussion with people in this room, touches pretty much everything we do as a city, right? Um, whether it be housing, childcare, all of these things. Um, I think that we've gone through this. I mean, I've gone through this ad nauseum um, and discussed it. At, I don't think we need an additional one, honestly. What do you think? I'm, I mean, I was leading the same way. If there was something uh -huh. very concrete and direct that uh, particularly folks who are working with the business community that are hearing from neighbors that are doing that level of engagement, if there was something that came in that was, this is what's completely missing from the goals of what we're trying to accomplish, I think, great, let's keep piecing away at it. Um, but I think we also have a tendency to keep revising and revising and revising. And I think we'll know pretty quickly if we've, we've missed something and can revise. But but I think these three goals really, for me, capture what my understanding of the plan was going to try to accomplish, right? And uh, I, I think that there, I mean, I we can even look at language. Like, so if there is something that, like, fundamental that we missed, does it fit within something or can something be modified to manage that? Because I there should be enough flexibility that if an urgent issue comes up, and well, one, we always have the opportunity like a fire to divert and to just do that. Um, but how how do we capture it in here? And I think in the um, every other month um, uh, subcommittee meetings, um, staff could sort of look at something and address it and see where it fits in and it would modify then um, the implementation itself. Okay. Um, and I do want to give a nod to, to Eric's comments. I think it'd be really helpful when we come to our conversation at council with uh, a discussion in the presentation about what accountability looks like, what checking back with the public looks like, what metrics look like, what track record looks like. Um, just even if it's, I know it's gonna be hard to go, go back and look, but even if it's something that we can put in the plan so that as we develop this in the future, that the public feels good about, is this achieving what we hoped that it would achieve, right? 
kind of dovetail off that. Yeah, but yeah, I think yeah, historical context uh, or what we what you can provide would be important. I think mm -hmm. when we have the benefit of having employees that have been here for 15, 18, 20 some years, you all have that ingrained already because you've done the work. But then we turn over on a regular basis, and you know we find not just in economic development, you know, a, a plenty of. Uh, strategic plans and whatever else. I was like, oh yeah, we did this in 2012. And I was like, I wasn't even paying attention to certain things in 2012. So um, anything you could supply, I think, um, to give us context would be would be much appreciated. Okay. Yep. I was gonna make a Sun Devils joke, but. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good. They're funnier when you explain them. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've learned that with my puns <laughs> all the time. Uh, all right, then let's go into with the different objectives. I know you've gone through them. Uh, are there any that you, let's start with, are there any that you think are unclear? I don't, I don't really think so because I think, like, as you've said, we've, we've been working on this and yeah. it, it has been drilled down already based on feedback. Um, I don't personally think anything needs to be made more clear. But again, it's also one of those things where when you get into the weeds, you understand right. what you're trying to convey, you know, and it may not be clear to the, the external stakeholders. So, but for me being in the circle, so to speak, I, I, I think we're good. And, and as you've discussed that, and I agree, and as you've discussed things with folks, have, has there been any glaring omissions that anybody's brought up with you? No, not, nothing glaring that needs to be addressed immediately. I think to, to raise this point about, um, uh, goals, same with objectives, is we can, if something does come up, we can always, I mean, it's easy to expand things, but just like, oh, we'll just add another one, but I think, you know, for sake of efficiency, we can just, you know, find a way for it to fit um, within reason, and not just shove it in somewhere. Yeah, I think. And I think, you know, what is interesting to me, and of course, now that I'm not going to be doing it anymore, but what I would hope you carry forward is, you know, the, the quarterly reports are, you know, it's just me doing them, right? Um, but I think that we can actually dig further in, like in the one that um, for October that's um, currently being vetted, you know, we look at manufacturing. So what does that mean? Well, that then, you know, that discussion maybe at the next um, uh, subcommittee meeting can dig deeper into that element in this and business attraction retention or something like that. Um, right. So we can we can use the quarterly reports um, a little bit to also enhance that community understanding um, because we are seeing that those are being used. I mean, I've had reporters calling me and saying, hey, I just read this thing. Um, so my suggestion would be um, let's start merging those in and being reflective. Yeah, and I think I can commit to doing that. I think the quarterly report is a good mechanism for reporting out progress on any level of a strat plan. Um, it may not get into the level of detail that we need to do other forms to discuss implementation strategies. Uh, but once we have this plan in place, I think the reporting moving forward, we start looking for the best mechanism to do that. Data, dashboards, quarterly reports. There's, there's quite a few tools in the toolbox to make that work. Um, but I think that, that that's a fabulous idea. And we can look in, in through this committee at what is the best tactic for communicating through that quarterly report. Is it working? Is there ads and deletes? It's a very helpful body to vet that out. Um, but I can absolutely commit to that today. Um, that, that's a very reasonable request and I think an excellent tool for helping um, increase the reporting on the plan. Yeah. Well, then with that said, I'm comfortable if we advance this to the council. Okay. Um, and then that allows for initial public comment. It has the staff report. It gives people a chance to kind of outside of this room mm -hmm. because we've got very limited uh, uh, interest in, in the time and right of the day. I, I know it matters. But the council meeting, I think, is where we'll really hear a lot of that feedback from folks that aren't here right now. So. Um, what about before we um, go off this, the priorities? I mean, any, because uh, I went through and thought, okay, what are we currently doing? Um, are you comfortable? Like, it's got three columns. It's a, a, a five-year program, but, you know, things bleed over. Um, did anything jump out? off the cuff if you haven't looked at this part yet on um, how I've set some of the priorities to move forward. No, so there were a couple where I might have might have quibbled with, but I'm going to uh, defer to staff on what current workload looks like and what you think your expected delivery time is. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I think I think overall, I think we can 
move things a little bit, but I'm not okay. overly concerned with. And again, this being a living document, we certainly can, but I just want to be able to have something to um, give staff to move forward to um, council with on sort of what what current capacity was um, and what we're currently working on. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, that was way easier. Than that was, I mean, <laughs> kind of I wasn't sure if we were going to walk through each of uh, the individual items, but we kind of did that last time. We did. So I figured. We did. Yeah. All right, let's go on then to our department reports. Um, we have anything to report? I'm leaving. Uh, <laughs> no, the department report, the other piece of that, um, I mean, in all seriousness, uh, my um, goal, and I think why I was pushing so hard to keep this on track to, um, uh, you know, the, study session and the um, council item was um, in making sure that we have a good transition through here. I do feel like we're leaving you in a good place. I will also state that Tara Thompson has also given notice. Um, so she's the third of the three of us, uh, myself, uh, Tara and Raphael. Um, she, her last day is on the 27th. Um, we are also leaving that in a very, very good place uh, in that we have the um, uh, public art strap plan um, the Art Public Places Committee all in just like record form for the whole, that, since we've been working on it. Um, and we've been here with that since the beginning. Um, so I think that we are leaving you in very good hands. Um, Raphael is going to hold down the ship uh, for us along with um, everyone else for whatever you choose to do with the division. But again, I know speaking on behalf of myself and uh, Tara, it's just been an absolute honor. Yeah. Thank you so much, Raisa. Yes, thank you. I would just like to quickly thank Raisa for all years of service for the city of Santa Rosa. That's it's an impressive career, mm -hmm. um, and you've you made quite a bit of difference in the city. And I just wanted to publicly thank you for that and wish you the best in your new endeavors. And we will do our best to move your initiatives forward. I will be watching. I'm still a resident. <laughs> <laughs> I can do public. You know how to get. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. We'll do public comment on department reports. Oh, not necessary. I said, cool. Citation order. Right? So, okay. okay. All right. Well, with that, everybody, thank you. We'll adjourn and we'll see you at the council meeting in about an hour. Thank you.